we are actually getting closer and closer to a national rent control strike. Uh, it is possible, you know, People are continuing to lose their apartments. Uh, people have been kicked out of their homes because they can't afford to pay these mortgages, to pay for their rent. And you have to give shout outs to organizations like KC Tenants for one, right? Like they're out there fighting for the tenants. They're in Kansas City. Nick talks about them a lot. But More Perfect Union actually brought this to my attention and they said that national rent control is closer than you think. There's actually a fight for this right now happening in Boston. And from what I saw earlier today, Shama Sawan is actually trying to lead a fight for rent control in Seattle as well. Uh, so pay attention folks, because it's coming. Now more perfect union actually shouted this out. It says national rent control is closer than you think. A historic wave of tenant organizing is on the verge of winning renter protections that would be attached to federal loans, affecting one in four apartments. But Graystar, Blackstone, and Avalon Bay are spending millions to block it. Let's go ahead and get into this video here. housing market is a catastrophe. Record rental prices across the United States. And something's got to give. Living in America is freaking ridiculous right now. I can't afford any of these apartments. $1,800 for a one bedroom apartment. $1,400 for 485 square feet. I guess I'll just live in my truck. Over a third of Americans are renters. And if you're in that category, you probably don't need to be told that the rental market is out of control. The question is, can anything actually be done about it? A historic wave of tenant organizing, unlike anything we've seen in decades, has found one answer. National rent control. The tenant movement is absolutely within striking distance of rent regulation at the national level. But it's not just tenants who are organized. This is also a story about how some of America's biggest landlords, banks, and private equity firms are hiding behind innocent sounding front groups, all yep. while pooling their money to keep your rent high. I moved into Waldo Heights in 2018. So I've been here five years now. And every year since I've been here, my rent has increased. I just want to pause here for a second and I want to mention something. Um, some cities actually have rent uh, stability and some don't. My city looks like Boston, for example, we don't have a uh, rent stabilization. What that means is that the landlords can continue to increase the rent as much as they want. Like if they want to increase the rent $100 one year and then next year $300, they can do that because there's nothing in place. There's no law uh, in place preventing them from doing that. So it's one thing to not have rent control, but it's another thing to not have rent stabilization, right? Let's continue. Every time my rent is raised, I'm at... Uh a crossroads of being evicted. Millions of renters like Val are trapped in a rental market that's built to empower abusive landlords who can raise rents each year while allowing conditions to get worse and worse. The mice, the roach infestations, sometimes they don't pick up our garbage. This is a way for them to push you out. I, I'm glad that she highlighted this, the garbage. When I actually went to Grant Manor, this was also a problem. Grant Manor is uh, a housing uh, complex here in Boston, and those tenants were going through the same thing. So like I covered that story. I interviewed tenants uh, there. And one of the things that stood out to me was they were allowing the trash to pile up, not the tenants, but the landlords, right? So this is something that they'll do. They'll allow the trash to pile up because obviously that's going to attract what? That attracts rodents, right? This is kind of a way to get them to push you out without saying that they're pushing you out. 
And then they'll allow, you know, a real estate company to buy that apartment complex building. They'll renovate it and make it all nice and, and spiffy for the next people that come in. They'll jack up the price. And the next thing you know, more gentrification is happening. So they'll make it so expensive that the people who grew up in that neighborhood can't afford to rent there anymore. And professionals will come in and you know, live in that building. But this is a tactic that they'll do. They'll allow the trash to pile up. So I'm glad she had a video clip of that. When I first moved here, I was told that the security gate was going to be fixed. The gate is still not fixed. And so people come in and they sleep in our hallways. I'm afraid sometimes to, to come in my building at night. My landlord is Landmark Realty um, Corporation based in California. They, they don't care. They just don't care. Since the last financial crisis, rental units are increasingly owned and operated by corporations like Landmark that are accountable, first and foremost, to their private investors. Another one is Wingate. That's the one here, one of the ones here in Boston that's very problematic as well. And oftentimes, these companies don't even, they're not even located in the cities that they, they own these properties. For tenants like Val, legal protections against abusive landlords are often limited. But she discovered one powerful way to fight back. So me and my neighbor, my best friend <laughs> down the hall from me, we just said one day, she was like, let's call KC Tenants. And I, I said, OK. So I called and I left a message on the hotline. And a couple of days later, I got a phone call back. A group called KC Tenants were fighting to stop eviction hearings at the Jackson County Courthouse. Evictions will kill people like me. Charged crowd packed city hall for more city. than three hours. The yellow shirts in the room are tenants, each with their own personal story. In a national housing crisis where rent inflation has vastly outpaced income growth, groups like KC Tenants have given their members power to take on their landlords. We have written and passed a tenant's bill of rights. We've won free lawyers for every tenant facing eviction. We've organized buildings and neighborhoods. And just recently we elected four members of city council. So this is very important. Here you have the activists actually not just helping the people, but also similar to Socialist Alternative, the people that are going into city council, that are going into these political positions, they're coming from the movement. They're coming from the grassroots uh, boots on the ground, so to speak. Now, there's something I want to mention in reference to Casey Tenants when they said we help tenants with their rights. This is very important. I think one of the things that people may not be aware of is the fact that from my experience, a lot of tenants don't realize their rights. They just don't know the laws that exist in their state. They're not familiar with landlord rights and what they can push back on and what they may not be able to push back on. So oftentimes they just feel hopeless. They feel lost. So an organization like KC Tenants is huge when they can come in and help people realize what their rights are in the first place. And that movement seems to be growing. Places like Louisville, Kentucky, Bozeman, Montana, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. The current surge in tenant organizing is the most significant since the 1970s, and it's allowing renters to fight for the kind of big relief that only the federal government can enact. There are millions of tenants across the country being squeezed by landlords like Landmark and our federal government is bending mm -hmm. right. 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 We can fight that. When Landmark Realty secured a mortgage for Val's building in 2014, their loan was actually backed by the federal government. Corporate landlords like Landmark often benefit from lucrative loans through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, yep. government-sponsored enterprises that purchase mortgages from banks and set terms for them. With one in four apartment units across the country financed in this way, the government is essentially in business with our landlords. The government and the banks. But that may be just the leverage that renters need. We want to see every dollar of federal financing conditioned on a set of tenant protections. If you're borrowing on really favorable terms, that money is backed by public dollars, you should be on the hook. You shouldn't be able to increase your rent 20% 
and evict a whole lot of tenants to maximize your profits for your investors. Again, that's where rent stabilization would be very important. That way they can increase the rent to 20%. What we want to see is them say, if you're borrowing from a government-backed enterprise, you can't increase the rent more than 3% year over year. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are regulated by the Federal Housing Finance Agency, or FHFA. Thanks to the work of tenant organizers, the FHFA is seriously considering policy along these lines. But there's just one problem. Tenants aren't the only ones who are organized. Mm -hmm. We're here at the National Multifamily Housing Council because the rent is too motherfucking high. They've spent so much of their time lobbying to make sure that rent protections don't exist for people like us. It's hard sometimes to fight back against these, these entities because of the fact that not only are they very organized, but they have a lot of resources. They're able to spend a lot of money to prevent you from organizing or to push back on you. Uh, this cannot continue. We cannot continue to have people constantly pushed out of their apartments, pushed out of their homes. The rent cannot continue to increase the way that it has. And I'm going to show you the cost of living report for 2023. And we're going to talk about this tomorrow um, at the labor summit as well. Because one of the arguments that I've been trying to make is it's really great to see all of these you know, employees on strike and demanding higher wages and demanding something as simple as health care. But what I've noticed is that the amount that they're asking for actually does not fit the cost of living report. And I went over this report last year as well. So essentially, a lot of these employees that are going on strike, they're actually selling themselves short. They should be demanding more than what they're demanding right now. We'll get into that in just a second. Landlord industry groups like the National Multifamily Housing Council spend millions lobbying Congress and federal agencies to oppose rent control. Since the start of last year, the NMHC has spent almost $10 million lobbying against it. Yep. The NMHC's members include major banks, private equity firms, and some of America's most notorious corporate landlords like Graystar, Avalon Bay, and Blackstone. Blackstone is the world's largest private equity firm, and by some accounts, the largest landlord in the U.S. In recent years, private equity firms like Blackstone have increasingly been buying up housing assets, often with lucrative loans backed by Fannie and Freddie. Tenants have complained of rent hikes, evictions, and faceless corporate landlords unresponsive to repairs. The U.N. even accused Blackstone of worsening the global housing crisis by buying up properties and hiking rents across the world. So this is one of the complaints that I've had. And so Kansas City is in Missouri. Missouri is a ballot initiative state. What are some of the things that could be done, right? Other than the organizing that's happening with the, the Casey tenants and things like that. Remember, Casey tenants is just, they're just one group. Like they need more help. They need, need more people on the ground. Well, one of the things that I think should be done, and I, I talked about this before, is that there should be a group organizing to put forth a ballot measure in Missouri to make it illegal for these corporations to be able to purchase properties in the first place. So outlaw private equity. And I think this is really important. We need to do this here in Massachusetts too, because if you don't have any law in place preventing them from doing this in the first place, this cycle is not going to end, you know? Like they said in the video, these are faceless corporate landlords. You don't get to see these people for the most part. Maybe you submit a ticket request, you get a, an email or a generic response to an email that you send to them complaining about issues with the building. But for the most part, you don't actually see these people and they like it that way. Meanwhile, Blackstone CEO Stephen Schwartzman earned $1.3 billion last year. For private equity firms like Blackstone, membership in lobbying groups is a way to protect their profits against threats like the current push for rent control. Notice they said private equity. See, that's what these groups are. You have to outlaw private equity from being able to own residential buildings. A 2023 lobbying disclosure shows the NMHC has been lobbying the Biden administration against rent control 
and the FHFA's oversight of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And it's not hard to guess what their lobbyists are saying in those meetings. Y'all, we just had a team of people go into the NMHC offices. We did a meeting with their government affairs director. Cindy told us this is just a problem of housing supply. That's a common argument from industry lobbyists, that if rent control limits developers' potential for profit, they just won't build as much housing. So I want to go ahead and debunk the shortage of housing myth, right? I hear a lot of people make this talking point. There is no shortage of housing. What we have is we have housing that seems to be more available to people who can afford to live there. Because when you have private equity owning these buildings, they continue to increase the rent. They continue to drive up the cost. So it's not so much that they don't have the housing. It's more so that they don't have enough housing for people that working class people and poor people can actually afford to live in. That's the problem. We saw something similar to this in 08. After the housing crisis, where companies like BlackRock bought these homes that were foreclosed. They renovated those homes. They increased the price. And that's part of the reason why you can't afford to buy a single family home. But this idea that we don't have enough homes, there are plenty of house, there's plenty of homes. There's plenty of homes. There's vacant buildings. They just don't price it so that you can live there. And that's the problem. So you have to get the corporate powers out. There's no question we need to build way more housing. And there are vigorous debates among housing advocates about how to do that through policies like zoning reform and public financing. But all of those proposals would take years to have an impact on rents. And the fact remains, renters need relief now. Time will tell if the federal government sides with tenants or corporate landlords like Blackstone. But the fact that these tenants have gotten this far is itself historic and a sign that those of us who are renters may have more power than we think. I agree. And again, like I said, I think it's only a matter of time uh, before there is a national rent strike. I mean, what are they going to do? They can't kick everybody out. Think about it. Now, I want to make the connection here with the cost of living report from 2023, because I think this is the piece that... A lot of people need to see, especially when people tell me that, uh, well, people just need to get better jobs. There's plenty of jobs out there and they can afford to pay the rent. Really? Let's see what the National Low Income Housing Coalition out of reach the cost of housing report says for 2023. And I think I'll share this in the chat with you guys, too, so that you can look at this on your own and you can look at your own state and see what you should you know, actually make to be able to live there. Now, I want to make this just a little bit bigger. Whee! There we go. 2023. So let's just go to the map. How much do you need to earn to afford a modest apartment in your state? Now, I want to show you something. All of the states that are dark blue, those are the higher cost, right? The highest. Then it goes to the Carolina blue, and then it goes to the light blue. If you pay attention to this map, you will notice when people make the argument, it's only the blue states that have this issue. Notice you'll see some of these red states that also have this issue. So let's start off with a state like Texas. In Texas, in order to afford a two-bedroom rental home, you need to make $25.06 an hour. If you make minimum wage, you will need to work 138 hours a week. You guys see the problem? Who in their right mind can work 138 hours a week? And if you want to see more info, you can just click on it here. And I just want to show you what it looks like. Texas. You'll see the minimum wage in Texas is $7.25 an hour. Two-bedroom housing wage, again, you need to make $25.06 an hour. But you'll see, I mean, this is 
This is ridiculous. Even to afford a one bedroom apartment in Texas, if you make the minimum wage, you have to work 116 hours a week. These are the things that people don't talk about when they say there's plenty of jobs. Joe Biden has created all these jobs. They don't tell you what those jobs are actually paying people. 2023 and the federal minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour. You cannot afford to live off that in this country, regardless of what state you live in. The closest state that comes to that, and I'm going to show you Puerto Rico, actually not a state, but the closest one that comes to that is Puerto Rico. Now, maybe we should all move to Puerto Rico. Okay, because they are 52nd in the highest housing wage in Puerto Rico. You need to make ten dollars and thirty six cents an hour to afford a two bedroom rental home. Maybe we should all just move. I don't know. The hours needed to work for minimum wage is 44 hours a week. No other state gets this close, by the way. Puerto Rico is not a state, but none of the states get this close. None of them. $10 and 36 cents an hour. I want to remind you again, the minimum wage is $7 and 25 cents an hour. Let's go on. There's some other ones I want to show you because I don't know what happened to Florida. And so when people like Ron DeSantis, they like to make this argument that it's just the blue states. Florida is a red state. All the people telling you that Florida is a swing state miss me with all that BS. Florida is a red state that has a couple of blue spots. Now, in Florida, Florida is the 11th highest housing wage in this country. In Florida, you need to make $30.59 an hour to afford a two-bedroom rental. If you make the minimum wage, you have to work 111 hours a week. Now, my question is this. What the hell happened to Florida? Wasn't Florida the state that so many people from the Northeast would move to because it was more affordable? What happened to Florida? You see, when people move to these states that are less expensive, an influx of people come, those states are not as affordable anymore. That's why when people say just move south, the problem is going to continue. It's going to follow you. Let's look at another one. For all the people who are on strike right now in California. Now, the hotel workers are on strike in California. The actors are on strike, so are the writers. In California, which is number one for the highest housing wage, you need to earn $42.25 an hour to afford a two-bedroom rental. If you're making minimum wage, you have to work 109 hours a week. So the hotel workers who are on strike right now in California, they're asking for a $5 raise. They're making between $20 an hour and $25 an hour. Even if they are making $25 an hour and they get that $5 raise, that's $30 an hour. They're still way below what they need to make in California to be able to afford a two bedroom home. This is for the whole state. This is not just for Los Angeles. You guys see the problem? This is why we're moving closer towards having some type of a rental strike. I want to show you some other ones too. Colorado, for some reason, I don't know what happened here. But all of a sudden, Colorado, Colorado is eighth highest housing wage. You need to make $32.13 an hour in Colorado to afford a two-bedroom rental. You have to work 94 hours a week if you make minimum wage in Colorado. So I don't know what happened there. Right? Let's go on to another one. I want to go to one that people may not think. I was actually kind of surprised by this one. Georgia. Even in Georgia, you need to make $24.75 an hour to afford a two-bedroom apartment. If you make minimum wage in Georgia, you have to work 137 hours a week. Guys, again, that whole fight for 15, that's nothing. That's nothing. That's why I said maybe we could move to Puerto Rico. 
But other than that, most of these states, you'll see that 15. No. Now let's go to another red state, Alaska. Even in Alaska, you need to make $26.32 an hour to afford a two bedroom rental. You need to make 97, work 97 hours a week if you make minimum wage. That's a red state, Ron DeSantis. That's a red state, Donald Trump. You see what I'm saying? These are the things they're not showing you. So you got Alaska. You have Florida. Are we calling Arizona swing state or is Arizona still red? In Arizona, you need to make $29.93 an hour. 12th highest housing wage. You need to work 86 hours a week if you make minimum wage in Arizona. Let's go to another one. Even Montana, even in Montana, 36th highest in housing wage, you have to make $19.28 an hour. Again, even in Montana, $15 an hour is not going to cut it. You have to work 77 hours a week if you make minimum wage. Let's go to another one. Let's go to Utah. Even in Utah, red state, you need to make $24.93 an hour. It's 22nd in highest housing wage. And if you're making minimum wage in Utah, you have to work 138 hours a week. Let's go to, I mean, I already know my state is expensive as fuck, but just for fun, Massachusetts, you have to make $41.64 an hour. And I live here and I know, (laughs) I know. Okay. So for the people who come at me and say, oh, well, you have a home and da, 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 da. You were an academic. You see how much you have to make in Massachusetts? $41.64 an hour. Third highest housing wage. If you make minimum wage here, you have to work 111 hours a week. If we click on more info, we'll dive into this one. The minimum wage in Massachusetts is $15. That fight for 15 isn't going to do you much here. I want to show you one thing here as well. If you scroll down, another thing that they'll show you, along with housing wages, Like, this is crazy. Annual income needed to afford if you, a zero bedroom, which is a studio. So if you want to have a studio apartment in Massachusetts, you have to make at least $64,000 a year. I know people here are making like $40,000 a year. This is why everybody has roommates. If you want a one bedroom apartment, this is insane, guys. A one bedroom apartment, you need to make at least $70,000 a year. To get that two-bedroom apartment that you want, you need to make $86,000 a year. This is crazy. This is not sustainable. But as you can see from the map, it's not just Massachusetts. It's not just New York, which we all know uh, that's New Jersey. New Jersey's up there too. But it's not just New York. It's not just Massachusetts. It's not just California. This is happening all across the country. And it is a problem. Missouri, which is in the video, you need to make $18.54 an hour, 41st highest housing wage. If you're making minimum wage, you have to work 62 hours a week. Let's look at Missouri and we'll wrap up here. If we scroll down, the minimum wage in Missouri is $12 an hour. So it's just, again, they're not even at the 15. This is why I continue to say when people call my generation lazy, not wanting to work as hard, you guys want everything given to you and handed to you, send them this report. 